The COVID-19 pandemic has affected most sectors of the global economy through both supply and demand shocks, including shocks to trade flows and the financial sector. The decline in trade flows in 2020 was accompanied by a crisis in trade finance. While banks became more risk averse and restricted their lending, while firms' borrowings also dropped as demand for their products deteriorated. This in turn led to increased costs of short-term financing for SMEs and higher rejection rates of applications. While the Asian Development Bank has just published the results of its 2021 Trade Finance Gaps Growth and Jobs Survey. To look at this in more detail, let's join ADB's Stephen Beck, who's moderating a discussion with Sin Young Park, Director Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department at the Asian Development Bank. Mark Obween, Council Econo uh, Economic Research, the World Trade Organization. Natasha Condon, uh, Managing Director, Global Head of Core Trade at JP Morgan. And Li Chu Tui, Vice Chairwoman, CEO at Southeast Asia Commercial Bank, Vietnam. Thanks very much. Let's get straight into this. Sin Young, as you know, Asian Development Bank has been tracking and estimating the global trade finance gap uh, since the global financial crisis. And I think there's very broad agreement in the market that it's really important that we track these gaps because the financing is critically important uh, to underpin the growth in trade that we so desperately need to achieve the sustainable development goals. And the United Nations recognized this a few years ago. But now, more than ever, as we're trying to dig our way out of the, the, uh, the devastation that the pandemic has wrought on the global economy, it's more than important than ever to ensure that we've got sufficient financing uh, to back trade growth globally. So, Sinyoung, what does the latest update on the, the global trade finance gaps, growth and jobs study say. What are the highlights, please? Thanks, Steve. Well, ADB's trade finance gaps, growth and jobs survey aim to enhance our understanding of the size of uh, trade finance shortfalls. In 2021, our survey included 74 banks from 40 countries and then 469 firms from 72 countries. And it gives a very good uh, idea of what the pandemic impact has been on trade finance. Our survey uh, shows that the uh, uh, global finance trade uh, trade finance gap increased to 1.7 trillion in 2020, which is a 15% increase from our earlier estimate of uh, 1.5 trillion in 2018. The, uh, as we all know, global trade contracted during the pandemic uh, by 7.5%. Uh, Therefore, this actually means as a percentage of global uh, trade of merchandise goods, the gap increased to 10% in 2020 compared to 8% in 2018. Access to trade finance continue to favor larger firms. More than 50% of trade finance applications being rejected by banks were from uh, small and medium sized enterprises, SMEs. Um, while 40% of these uh, trade finance demand has been from SMEs. Most banks and firms surveyed also indicated that the pandemic has accelerated the adoption of digital tools in uh, their uh, operations. Digitalization in trade finance can narrow the trade finance gap through cost reduction, but the high cost of technology and the lack of technological expertise were also cited by banks as still the major constraint uh, to trade finance. Most of all, global standards and legislation are going to be required to realize the potential of uh, digitalization in trade finance. Oh, thanks, Sinyoung. So that's, uh, that's quite alarming. So the gap has never been larger. Um, Malk, uh, what do you think of the results of the study? Anything uh, surprising in there for you? Thanks very much, Steve, uh, for inviting me for this uh, panel where I speak on my own capacity. Uh, yes, I am struck by uh, two or three points that, that really um, uh, emerge from this study. First, that gaps increased during the pandemic, despite the fall in trade. 
gaps have been relatively uh, constant around 1.5 trillion uh, in the period of expansion of trade prior to the pandemic. And what can see is an increase in the rejection rates during the pandemic. So that's the first lesson. The second is that gaps tend to affect the smaller traders, um, the SMEs, uh, women-owned SMEs in particular were struck by the 70% rejection rate there. Um, and th three, uh, that the, the lower the level of income, um, the higher the likelihood of gaps. And it isn't said explicitly in the survey, but what can draw this from the fact that SMEs have the highest rejection rates. And uh, since in low income countries, there's a greater likelihood that traders be SMEs, hence the rejection rate overall in these country um, is likely to be higher as a result. Um, the second point I'd like to make here is that the ADB study uh, all brings it together. Um, there has been a number of studies uh, done in the context of uh, the pandemic uh, over uh, trade finance trends, and I here just mentioned the OECD, the Bank of International Settlement, the uh, IFC um, from the World Bank Group um, annual survey on COVID-19 and trade finance in the emerging markets, and and, and the African Development Bank and the Bern Union, and they all have different pieces uh, which points to difficulties in emerging market, but the ADB um, study all brings it together, provide the numbers, and has one additional element which um, is very interesting, which is the company survey. It not only surveys the banks, but it also surveys uh, the companies and what they have to say about uh, the situation. And uh, one last thing, though, is we have to be careful about messaging um, because the, um, uh, the, the survey is a picture taken in 2020. So in terms of the trends, even up to now, while we are now um, uh, towards the end of 2021, the trade markets um, uh, seem to have recovered somewhat uh, in some of the main routes of trade where and when liquidity was uh, abounded and, uh, and affordable. But, uh, and for example, that comes from the, the Bern Union survey. Uh, but one important message of the ADB survey, and I'd like to close on this, is that uh, the same as those from the IFC or the uh, African Development Bank, is that the mo most vulnerable trader, uh, traders remain hit um, and um, the, hence the large demand for your own uh, facilities and product and that for other um, MDBs. So I think these are the things that have uh, drawn my attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks very much, Malk. And yeah, as per usual, it's always the, uh, the weakest um, who, uh, who are going to end up suffering the most, whether it's SMEs or um, now we see huge spikes in uh, prices for food and energy, and of course, the poor spend a disproportionate amount of their income on energy and food, and so that has to be a big concern. Um, and of course, that's going to be eating into into the the the, the gap as well. It's going to be enlarging the gap uh, since you know uh, prior to uh, the the dramatic increase in these prices. If you would support a, a transaction for a million dollars, and suddenly that that transaction is now you know, a million four hundred thousand dollars, then you know you can you can do much less with what country limits you've got to support trade finance, as well as counterparty limits. So that's it's going to contribute to uh, to the gaps. Ms. Tweed, what uh, what are your general impressions? A sort of high level view on the study and its implications, please. Yes, for sure. This survey has been. Uh, um, very informative, and I think that it has provided us with hard numbers of what we have been looking at the, the reality. So trade is important to the economic growth, and through the surveys, you understand the global trade finance gap is increasing, especially during the pandemic. And, and what we start seeing more and more is the standardization and simplification of procedures in trade finance are really required to promote trade finance in the upcoming time. And uh, it's, um, it's very clear that it is important for the regulators, uh, the banks, the businesses to work together to overcome the gap and uh, 
probably the main relevance uh, will come down to digitalization and how it can help with uh, uh, bringing that um, a trade finance gap uh, down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Natalie, uh, uh, sorry, Natasha, what are, what are your thoughts? I, I think very similar, to be honest. I think the the headline number that obviously makes you pause when you when you look at the survey is that that one point seven trillion. The fact that the trade finance gap is growing, we are going you know globally in the wrong direction in terms of you know access to to trade finance, and I guess after what we've all been through in the last 18 months, that's maybe not a total surprise, but it, it's something to see in hard numbers. And one thing that, that Ms. Tui mentioned that, that comes out very strongly from the survey is that, you know, that it's an inequality story. The access to finance, as you say, has, has reduced more for SMEs than it has for large corporates. And if you look at the data in the survey that talks about why that is happening, it seems to me that really it's talking about inequality of information access that you know the, the the cost of access to information for banks to lend to a small company potentially in an emerging market is so much higher relatively than the cost of information to to lend to a large corporate that that in itself is is becoming part of the problem yeah absolutely and mystery what, what do you think of that i mean natasha mentions that um you know smes of course are uh, not the easiest to uh, to serve, and, and maybe a lot of that has to do with uh, the information flow on SMEs. Um, is there a lack of information there? Um, how does CBank sort of manage uh, 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 its SME clients um, and, and that, that sort of market segment? Well, thanks a lot, Stephen. So I think that the pandemic outbreak uh, made import export enterprises and SMEs in general face a lot of difficulties in maintaining their production and their activities. And then hence that affects the, the way they are able to fulfill the obligations to the bank, resulting in higher rejection rates. And then for with the macro uncertainty due to the pandemic has caused banks to focus on their fund, focus their funding on established relationships. So definitely this flight to quality has left many worthy businesses but particularly the small and medium enterprises in uh, developing countries or emerging market like ours uh, without an option for trade finance. Mm -hmm. And for CBank in particular, I, I think this is uh, uh, a topic that we have uh, talked not just within the bank, but also among the banks and with the, the central bank as well. Uh, we, uh, it has always been our strategy to focus on SME and uh, women owned SME in the upcoming time. Uh, but normally, due to the smaller scale and resources, the information on them are very limited. Therefore, it is challenging for us to support the segment. And uh, in Vietnam, there is an association that is uh, uh, the Vietnam Association of Small and Medium Enterprises. I believe that, for example, uh, if this organization can help collecting the information from the SMEs and uh, work with the credit information center of the State Bank of Vietnam, then we will be able to build a credit risk database of SME. And then this information is shared with the banks in order to support our underwriting process. So from a bank's perspective, we uh, can continue to develop the specialized private banks uh, uh, for SME financing which has a specialized team on different industries of SME. And, and this really promotes a specialization and help to serve SME better and overcome the challenges of getting sufficient information on this segment. I think that is very clear for the bank's role in supporting trade finances SMEs in the upcoming time, despite the challenges, because if we are able to do so, then we will be able to support the recovery of the economy post the pandemic. I'd like to pick up on uh, on, on something you uh, you mentioned, uh, and that's uh, that's women led uh, companies and, and, and SMEs. And uh, uh, the survey suggests that they're not doing all that well either. Um, they're suffering from a lack of support. Um, Natasha, any, uh, any any thoughts on how we can do a better job of inclusion, especially with respect to women? 
Well, I, I think fundamentally it's a it's a bit of a twofold problem, right? There, it's it's within the industry and without. There are not enough women in the finance industry doing the lending, um, and there are not enough women in in the the corporate client base receiving that that financing. So, within the industry, I think we're moving in the right direction. You can feel that there's kind of the the trend in the industry towards better representation of women, and particularly in in more senior positions. Um, I personally believe that if you're going to hit a target like that or if you're going to make something like that happen, um, only hard targets will really allow for the kind of accountability that you need to achieve that. And, you know, JP Morgan, for example, has signed up to hard targets with regard to representation of women within its own senior ranks. Um, And I think that kind of action, which many, many banks are taking, is, is very important. And then in the client base, it's a... again, there's two pieces to it. First, you need data and then you need action. We need to be able to identify companies who are disadvantaged, whether it's because they're, you know, women owned, whether they're owned by any other minority group who are underrepresented in their social context. And then we need to target financing directly at them, just as as Ms. Tui was saying. Um, And I'm, I'm personally quite excited about some of the moves we've seen around sort of ESG driven, diversity and inclusion driven trade finance structures, which are very tightly targeted or intended to deliberately push cheaper financing in the direction of those companies. Um, you know, there's some very exciting stuff happening on in, in that space, both within JP Morgan and, and in the market more broadly. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the, the sort of an underlying theme uh, uh, often is, uh, and it goes back to information, it's driving transparency through supply chains, understanding companies better, including um, uh, uh, labor rights and inclusion for women. I think there are a lot of, uh, there's a total lack of statistics around this space. I know that Asian Development Bank is doing some work to collect better stats to understand the problem uh, better so that we can uh, we can do a better job of addressing it, including in, in Vietnam. I think we're in the process of, of generating some of those statistics. Um, um, so hopefully we'll be able to, uh, uh, to move up the curve in that regard. Um, Sinyan, moving away um, from, from just sort of narrowly uh, sort of focusing on some uh, segments of the economy, uh, although extremely important, segments of the economy that are underserved, and just sort of pulling back uh, more of a macro picture. What are some of the things that you think we need to do now to close these market gaps? We all agree that you know it's really important that we close them. They're there. They're getting bigger. Um, we've we've never had a time in history maybe where it's been more important to ensure we have sufficient financing to back trade like growth. What can we do to to close these gaps? You think? Well, ADB has been doing quite a lot of uh, things on uh, various uh, different fronts. Well, in uh, you know, reducing the gap in trade finance, we need uh, you know actually more finance also, uh, and uh, our technical assistance as well as uh, you know preparing some uh, you know platform for better knowledge sharing. Um, since April last year, ADB has provided. Uh, finance and guarantees of about uh, 10 billion US dollars, um, including about 6 billion uh, in co-financing in trade finance transactions. Uh, This also included uh, 2 billion US dollars for food security and agriculture, as well as uh, 78 million US dollars for medical supplies. ADB has been also working with uh, uh, ICC and uh, Enterprise Singapore in launching the Digital Standards Initiative. Uh, The goal in here is to establish a globally harmonized digital uh, trade environment with end-to-end interoperability across all trade actors. ADB has been also supporting the global legal entity identifier system to help SMEs better integrate it into the global trading system. Uh, This will help firms validate the identity of uh, potential clients. And uh, for banks, uh, this will also help in terms of the uh, uh, KYC and then AML uh, requirements. Uh, This may uh, also help uh, reduce the 
fraudulent activities. Uh, and along with these efforts, uh, ADB has been continuously providing the capacity building and the knowledge uh, sharing. Um, and uh, apart from this, uh, aid, uh, in uh, supporting the, uh, the supply chain of uh, uh, critical uh, medical goods, ADB also initiated an interactive mapping tool uh, in, the, uh, in the height of the pandemic last year. Um, a lack of information, as uh, all of us have mentioned, has been a very key barrier to uh, this uh, uh, trade uh, and the supply chain disruptions. And uh, this uh, mapping tool has been also very helpful in terms of uh, helping identify uh, who's supplying what in the uh, supply chain of uh, uh, critical uh, medical goods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, especially with respect to the, uh, the collaboration. And of course, um, we've worked on, uh, uh, on countless deals with, uh, with C-Bank and um, uh, JP Morgan uh, to, uh, to to fill some of these gaps in some of the more challenging markets. Um, Ms. Twe, uh, what do you think? What do you think we should be doing to to close these gaps? And and uh, as part of that, do you think that the the move to scale up digitalization will uh, will help us get that kind of information we were talking about before that we that we need to uh, to service SMEs more? Yes, I think the key. Uh, to close the gap is definitely the collaboration and the communication. Uh, it's really important for all parties involved um, to recognize that and to start communicating and start trying, start getting into the process in order for us to move forward. For emerging market, we need to actively strengthen the exchanges, the cooperation and promote the correspondent network. Actually, with global financial institutions, uh, including, including the multinational development organizations such as ADB. Um, I think this is a stepping stone, really, because these are the intermediaries connecting the financial institutions and the markets. So that will really help um, the, uh, to, to expand the operation and connect with other financial institutions in performing trade finance transaction for customers. Uh, for digitalization, I think that there's a lot of uh, work involved in because the parties are everywhere all over the countries and the um and, and, and the adoption of new technology in in trade finance uh is recognized as important but uh it has been uh, a bit slow luckily uh, on the other side of the pandemic it has really made us see that it is vital, is no longer a consideration. So we are uh, looking at how the digitalization is driving down the cost of trade finance uh, transaction. I definitely agree with Xin Yong with the support of technology in uh, KYC and AML, how we can reduce the risk on that. And with tools to aggregate and analyze huge volume of data, it uh, will also help the bank uh, intelligent models as well. Um, and and um, so definitely um, to come back to the, the main question, I believe that we need to start working, collaborating very closely in order to standardize and simplify trade finance process. And um, it is the, the, the bank's role to uh, look at SMEs for uh, the future growth and as part, as a significant, significant part of the economy rather than uh, just a portion of uh, the bank book. And we need to put a lot of effort investments in working with these SMEs in the digitalization process because it's a cost investment for them. So we need to work in order to convince them for the longer term results and how we can support them with that cost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as, as uh, Sin Young mentioned, we've uh, been working with the International Chamber of Commerce and the um, government of Singapore to create this digital standards initiative um, that's going to create the, the protocols and standards to help drive interoperability and hopefully make it uh, uh, a lot cheaper and easier 
for financial institutions to support SMEs, for SMEs to uh, to be part of the, the, the global economy by lowering uh, barriers to entry. It's sort of mind blowing if we really can uh, achieve that level of interoperability, including throughout the entire uh, trade ecosystem from, from exporters to shipping, to ports, to customs, to warehousing, finance and importers. If we can make that seamless, um, then it's just uh, amazing the kind of productivity gains we could get and the, the, the metadata that would help us address a lot of these issues in, uh, you know, know your clients, anti-money laundering, uh, you know, performance risk around SMEs and, and so on. So, um, uh, and, and that digital standards initiative, of course, is going to in involve, have to involve everyone, uh, you know, pitching in to develop these standards and uh, and ultimately adapt them. Um, and then I think the, you know, the, the, the second bit of that, and I think, you, Ms. Twee, you alluded to that, is that there's, there's, there isn't enough legislation to, to back the real advancement of trade. So we've been promoting, and we're doing this very sort of aggressively now with a lot of countries, is to say, look, please adapt the model laws that the UN have developed on uh, electronic documents. Um, and uh, the, the, the difference that could make would be, would be incredible. Um, uh, Natasha, what, what are your views, please? Where do you think we need to we need to focus in order to close these gaps? So I, I definitely agree with all of that, and I think um, you know you and, and Ms. Twee both pulled out a couple of really important points there about you know we can all see that digitization is the answer, but making digital available to SMEs is not an easy thing, and. You know, you cannot possibly expect a small company to sign up to multiple platforms to 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 make a single trade transaction work. We're going to have to interoperate, um, which means that the private sector's got to step up and and, and collaborate and, and find ways to work together. And that can work also from a, a perspective of of just the the simple credit approval and financing access, because you know there, there's been this enormous global stimulus in the face of the pandemic. There is liquidity sloshing around the global economy looking for somewhere to go everyone is hunting yield there is money out there that wants to lend but it's not getting to all of the parties who who want to receive it and that's where that information gap is that we've got to find a solution to so i think for me the the private sector's got to get better at, you know when we have a relationship with that sme we need to find ways to share that information with more parties so that there are more lenders who can access that sme as well um, we need to work better with the public sector and ADB and other MLAs, as Ms. Twee said, have really stepped up during this crisis to, to, to stand behind a lot of countries and, and corporates. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, we've got to digitize, we've got to smooth the flow of trade. And I think there is an opportunity there for the big players with the big tech budgets to share those benefits with the smaller ones. Um, and, and make that technology available in a way that's a bit more accessible to those who, who don't necessarily have the, the big tech budgets. And if we can do that, we will really see some change. Indeed. Yes, and Stephen and Natasha, Natasha thank you for that. that uh, sorry, Stephen and Natasha, if I could interrupt. I think that I completely agree with Natasha in a way that, for example, ATB has stepped up uh, the role. Uh, I think for a bank from an emerging market, uh, we would really... Um, uh, expect the international finance organizations such as ADB to increase the trade finance limit provided to banks so that we can provide more support to enterprises, especially SMEs. And building capacity is another success factor. And definitely we can close the gap quicker if there is cyclical support uh, from such uh, organization like ADB. Just want to add on to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for, for mentioning that. As, as you know, we, we do uh, a, a lot of capacity building with banks in our uh, developing member countries, and we're, uh, we're looking forward to doing lots more. Um, we've grown our, uh, the number of transactions we've been doing over the pandemic by 50%. Um, so uh, uh, we've been we've been pleased to be able to do that, but of course it's it's never enough. So we look forward to doing more, and we need to leave it there. Unfortunately, thank you so much to the panelists. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion, very much appreciated, especially uh, you taking a, a Sunday. 
um, and uh, very much looking forward to working with you on transactions, the cap capacity building, and, and to closing these gaps. Um, thank you so much.